the larger consciousness system, when it started making individuated units of consciousness, uh, and it expected those individuated units of consciousness then to interact with each other and with it to make more possibilities for it to grow into, what well, it did, but the big cheese wasn't very grown up yet because it had been a monolithic thing. It hadn't had anything else with free will to have to deal with. So in the beginning, it had all these individuated units of consciousness that it had spawned, and it was it had to learn how to deal with them. And its first intuition was just like us, control, power, and force. Welcome back. Mr. Tom Camel, this is the third interview that I've done with you, uh, or you know, set up with you. I'm very excited to talk to you. I love your work. Um, it's been a long time since we've had a conversation, so I'm very excited to catch up with you. How are you today? I'm doing just fine, Trey. Um, you know, life is good here. I'm busy, but busy is good too. I think busy keeps you young and engaged, and you you start to. Uh, you start to lose it when you're not busy, when you have uh, long periods of time where you just don't have anything to do. I think that's when you start to degenerate. So busy <laughs> is not a bad thing. You it's, look good, man. You look really good. Well, I'm, uh, I'm a year and a half away from 80 and uh, still uh, pretty fit. <laughs> How much time are you spending out of body? Oh, well, you know, out of body is a... Is a is a, is a term that means things to people who like read journeys out of the body, but it doesn't have to be like that. If out of body is just not in this consciousness in some other place, not necessarily flying around in locale two or three or four or something like that, then uh, I'm in and out all the time. Hmm. Even as we have our conversation, as you ask me things and I need to gather a little information for an answer, I'll slip out and gather that information. And, and it just, it's just natural. It's just a part of everyday life. It's not a, you know, and meditation's like that too. I don't really meditate anymore. Life is a meditation. If I need information, if I need a connection, um, whatever, I just, I have it. It's there at the fingertips. It takes, microseconds to get out of body if if you like you can just switch data streams grab what you need come back and most of the part nobody even notices so it's the same with meditation i don't have a special time or you know set aside when i meditate but i'm in and out of of that uh, point consciousness state all the time sure how have your experiences changed, right, in those different locales from when you first started to right now, getting ready to turn eighty soon, right? Like we still have a little yeah. bit of you know a little bit of time for that, but standing here today in this moment, like how much has your experiences changed? Well, experiences have changed, I guess, slowly. They they've changed kind of the nature of them. When I was first down this path, then it was you're either here or you're there. You know, and if you're going to go there, well, it takes you about 10, 15 minutes, 20 minutes to get in the right frame of mind and, you know, to get your, your, your mind connected elsewhere and go. And it's a thing you do to go there. And they're two very separate places. And now that's just not true. They're not separate places anymore. So that means that instead of having an OG experience, wow, experience, because you have met these entities and you're having this discussion and they're telling you this or that. That doesn't really happen much anymore. That happened back in the beginning when I was very anxious to, uh, uh, you know, meet people and learn things and so on. But it's not that I don't want to learn things anymore. I learn things all the time. It's, it's just that once you understand how everything works and what's going on and so on, it's just not a big deal anymore. It's just part of the background noise. Like, you know, you've traveled 
you've traveled around the places and when you first got to the Asia, you first got to Europe, or you first got to wherever it is you went, or you first went to the beach and saw the ocean, you know, and you have all these things. And at the time it was, wow, look at that, the ocean. And uh, it doesn't feel like that anymore. It's the ocean and you go there and you enjoy it and you, you, uh, you swim, you play in the waves, but uh, it's not uh, OG wow, it's just part of the natural reality that I live in, just like, you know, this physical reality has a lot of different things in it, you know, you're in it, and I'm in it, and we interact like this, it's just part of the way the reality works. So I think that's what happens as you, as you get rid of fear. And if you explore long enough, you get to the point that you live in a much larger reality, you don't just live in this virtual reality called the physical universe. Your space that you live in every day is just bigger than that. And it doesn't have lines or barriers between it, like I'm here and I'm there. Here and there are all the same place. It's all the same thing. It's just one big continuum. So my experiences are, are uh, uh, more general, not so specific as they used to be, in the sense that I'm not searching out this particular kind of information because I'm trying to understand that particular thing. I understand that particular thing already, and I'm not doing that as much. Now, as I run into things that I'd like to understand, I do do that, but it's not like the center of my experiences in the non-physical. They're really, for me, isn't so much a non-physical and a physical anymore. There's just, there's just information that I can connect with. Just like I'm connecting with you now, I could connect at the same time with something else. Can you connect with your past self and influence that? You can't influence your past self. The past is done. The past isn't a, a, an ongoing thing. When the past is over, it's over. And then after that, it's just history. Now you can get into that past database and play in that because there is not only everything you did and thought of and felt, but the probabilities of other things that you might have thought and felt but didn't. So you can play around all those possibilities and, and, uh, and probabilities. And sometimes that is instructive, but Mostly, again, I don't really find past lives to be that interesting. Um, they're, they're not a big pool. I don't spend a lot of time in that, though they're just recently. And it wasn't a past life. It was something going on in this life. It was a, uh, an interaction I had with a person, oh, 50 some years ago. And uh, it just uh, kind of came up as, as uh, there were a lot of details about that that I, I uh, didn't recall. And I wanted to recall those, so I went back and re-experienced it. So I just, you know, it's not like you have to go get into the database and you have to meditate. I just, you know, my mind just went there. It wasn't here anymore. And I re-experienced that. Mm-hmm. So, and all of the details was still, was still there. It, uh, it wasn't that I was watching it in a movie. I was there in the experience. So you can do things like that, but they're, to me, they're, they're not so much I go and do it as I just do it. It's, I don't see it as going anywhere. It's just part of the fabric of reality that's available to experience. Sure. Um, so it's so interesting, right? Like the, the some of the books that I've been reading, right, uh, have been very broad and their ideas or definitions of consciousness, right? And they're all fascinating to me. They all whet my appetite. Um, but there have been some ideas recently popping up of like a new earth, right? Like of uh, maybe a new earth, I don't know, evolving or and or a frequency and then some of us going there. Have you been to any location or had the experience where humanity resided on a new earth a new earth so you mean this particular planet in this particular universe you're not talking about you're not talking about a different universe with people on it but you're talking about this this universe Mm -hmm. uh no 
uh, this planet is part of a, an ongoing virtual reality game. It is where it is. Okay, now there will be something that you might want to call a, a new earth, but it's not really a new earth. It's the same old earth. What it is is, is uh, uh, more, more quality of consciousness of the people that are on the earth, which make it seem like a really new place because it's not the same old warlord mentality, you know, who, who, who's king of the hill today, you know, kind of thing that, that we humans have lived with since the beginning that humans, you know, were walking around, what, about 200,000 years ago. Um, you know, our culture has been fairly violent and uh, it's, it's uh, more of, uh, you know, the, the strong, um, what, uh, manipulate and, and abuse the weak kind of thing. That's just the way we've been. Humanity has had that low quality of consciousness. But yes, in the future, and I don't think it has to be a real, real distant future. We may be talking two, three decades, you know, something that's uh, within the lifetime of, of probably most of the people listening to this, where we will have a much uh, kinder, gentler, more uh, considerate uh, place to live. I what does it look like, it. right? Like, have you, have you experienced that? Well, I can only experience that in terms of probability. The future doesn't exist either to places we could end up in the future, say three decades from now. And uh, I see that there's a fairly high probability that we, that we will take a, a uh, kind of a big step in the, in the growing up of our, of our uh, consciousness, you know, evolving our consciousness in the near future. Again, you know, three, 20, 30 years, that sort of thing is what I mean by near future. Um, so I think that has a good you know, probability, and it doesn't have to happen. I can also see that there's possibilities with, with lesser probability that we go backwards a bit, that we won't even, in two decades, we won't even be as grown up as we are now. That's a possibility, but it's not, a, you know, not as likely. It's not as high a, a probability that that's the way it's going to be. But we, we uh, actualize the future, you know, by our choices. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Who, who we are is the sum of all the choices we've ever made. And who, you know, how this planet works and, and what we've done with it is the sum of all the choices we've made. You know, it's the same thing. So we make different choices, then it becomes a different place. It becomes not a different place in, in, uh, in the virtual reality called the physical universe, but it's a very different place to, to live in. Sure. I've also been reading this book called, I think it's uh, The Gene Codes or something like that. Um, have you had the experience where you can do things or, or change your DNA to like upgrade the body that you're in, right? To experience different levels of consciousness. Well, yes, um, that does work that way. It's not that you can just do anything you want, but there are some things that you can do that you can, you can uh, move. You know, if you decided like, well, gee, I often need a third arm, so I'd like to grow one right, right here and kind of grow it out so I have three arms because then I'd really be able to, you know, uh, hang paper, uh, you know, I, I could do wallpaper really, really well with three arms. And uh, that's my career. So I, I'd like that. So you go meditate and pop a third arm out. That's not going to happen no. But there's a general rule in consciousness. And that is that the mind leads and the body follows. With your intent, you can modify future probability and the body will change to allow that consciousness to express itself in ways it wants to. But again, there's, it's probability. Growing an arm out of your chest is such a, uh, you know, a low probability, you know, in other words, it's so hard to do. It'd be so hard to make that happen. That, no, it's not likely you're going to be able to do that. But for instance, here's one that happens a lot with people, uh, people who are uh, negative, people who complain a lot and, you know, they're, they're always grouching about life and other people and so on, they will actually change 
their brain chemistry to produce less serotonin. So now they'll go see a doc and a doc will look at it and say, oh, your serotonin's low. You know, we'll put you on Prozac or, you know, something else because uh, that's why you're grouchy and in a bad mood and, and are negative all the time. It's because you don't produce enough neurotransmitters. Your serotonin's low. Well, the serotonin's low because they tended to be negative. You see, the mind leads the body, the body follows. Uh, if you have a, uh, you know, if you have a, a uh, well, what can we say? I'll say you have a lump here on your neck and you say, uh oh, I got a lump here in my neck. That's, a, that's right in there where these lymph glands are. That's, uh, that troubles me. You can raise the probability that that's cancerous by worrying about it and thinking that, oh, that's, that might be cancer and you'll raise the probability that it is. So your mind has a pretty, you know, big effect on the body. You know, placebo effect is mind affecting, you know, the body and how the body perceives things and how the body works. So yes, you can do things that actually will change the, I think maybe the right word is epigenetics of your system to where your brain chemistry changes, you know, your, uh, your ability to do things changes. You might be able to, um, like the guy who dives in and swims, you know, from one ice hole to the next ice hole, you know, uh, uh, something that would be physically very challenging and hard thing to do. But if you prepare your mind for it, then you can do things like that. You know, and we all know that from, you know, if you get to a point where you're just tired and you just don't seem to, you just don't have enough energy to, you know, even stand up, but then a need comes where you really need to stand up. Well, you find the energy, you know, it just, comes and maybe you find enough energy not only to stand up but to be very active and do whatever you need to do that's because it's you change things you actually rearrange your your physiology and and your biochemistry in order to do what you need to do so the mind is a is a is has a lot of power and the body is reasonably plastic as far as being able to, to mold it, some things harder than others. So it's easier to change the things that aren't so hard mm -hmm. to mold. Well, like having peak experiences, right? Like what they consider to raise your vibration or change the, the, the vibration of your cellular consciousness, right? To where you can have more experiences of either uh, the mystical type or and to, you know, in different locales, like how you experience them, right? Um, I was just wondering, right, like if we have to, uh, you know, is diet related to that, right? Is um, a, a monkish lifestyle related to that? Do we have to be abstinent, right? And, yeah. and experiencing different types of realities more frequently, right? Like, is that all associated with it, right? Or can yeah. someone just go out there like yeah. and just live their life, right? And just not give a damn about anything, right? And still have those experiences. <laughs> Uh, well, a few people don't give a damn about anything and will have those experiences, but that's because that in a, in a more, uh, you know, in not part of their intellect, in a more sub subconscious area of their, of their mind, they actually do have those skills that are necessary and they kind of, and they slide into it and out of it, but they're very rare. So you had a whole bunch of questions there and they were all good questions. So I'll try to get all of them. One diet does have a big effect on your biochemistry. Uh, I mean, it has a big effect on your mind. Uh, the way it works is that you're a piece of consciousness and your body's an avatar, but you as consciousness are the player okay, of the body, make all the choices for the body. I think we've been through all of that the last time we talked but you are limited by what that body can do. In other words, you're limited by the rule set by which that body operates. Now, you can modify that rule set some, and you can, you can modify the way that rule set may be applied to that body. But where you can manipulate most easily is where there is uncertainty. So those areas where there's uncertainty in your genetics or other places where uncertainty exists. In other words, things 
could go together this way or they could go together that way. Well, then you can use your intent to make them go together in the way that you want. Now, things like sugar are very uh, much in the way of you learning to, um, let's say, uh, learning to develop your intuitive side. Okay, you, you as consciousness process data through two separate channels. You get information through two separate channels. One is intellectual channel and one is an intuitive channel. Okay, so your intuitive channel will get clouded and be not very accessible or not very reliable. Say if your glucose levels are not stable. When you eat sugar, you get a big glucose levels fly up, then you, your pancreas squirts some, some uh, um, you know, What's the word? Um, I have no clue. <laughs> you're lost there. Your, your pancreas creates the, um, you know, what do diabetics need? Uh, insulin. Insulin, yeah. Your yeah. pancreas creates insulin. So it squirts some insulin into your system. So your blood sugar comes crashing down and now it's too low. Then it was too high. And by then you've eaten something else that has sugar in it. So it shoots up again, which means if, you're, if your blood sugar level is like this all the time, you know, going up and down and up and down, it's unstable. And that makes most of your brain unstable as far as the biochemistry in your brain. Glucose is pretty much the energy that the brain runs off of. So if you eat things that have sugar in it, and in our in a typical American diet, there's sugar in almost everything. Almost everything you eat will have some sugar in it. So just eating normal things, even though if you're not big into candy bars and lollipops, you will have sugar five, six, seven, ten times in a day. And that just keeps your sugar levels out of whack. They're not, they're not stable. And therefore, when you're doing the things that require a lot of sensitivity, you know, a lot of um, being able to distinguish very fine things as opposed to real coarse stuff, then it gets difficult. And that means your intellect can still work all right, because generally it works with kind of coarse stuff. You know, where, where's my glasses? Well, where did you last use them? You know, those are kind of coarse big things. But if you're doing intuitive things, that's much more subtle. And the sugar will just wipe that out to where it's unstable and it doesn't work well. So that would be one thing I would tell people. Yes, diet impacts. Don't eat things that have sugar in them, which means carbohydrates in general. So, you know, don't eat a lot of crackers and pretzels and carbohydrates. Um, like as far as like sexual energies, right? Like I've been yeah, fielding a lot okay. of questions about that. Like people are like, they're using their sexual energy yeah. for manifestation, right? They're, they're using these, these uh, ancient techniques to do that. But then there's also the idea and concept of being abstinent and very monkish and ascetic where yeah. you're using that energy to, 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 I guess, re-enter the body in a way that um, allows you to access different levels, levels of consciousness, if any of that makes sense. Okay. Most of that is, um, the best way to say it is unnecessary. Okay, it's not necessary to do any of those things. You can have a very full, uh, intuitive life. You can, you know, go out of body and heal and do all sorts of things in the paranormal side. You can grow and, and evolve the quality of your consciousness without ever becoming a monk, without ever changing almost anything in your life. You know, you're a busy life. You have wife. You have children. You have things to do. Uh, you know, you have dogs and cats and you know, your life is busy. And that's okay, you can still develop your consciousness just as well. Now, there are all sorts of things that you can use as tools that help you oh, focus your mind or, uh, you know, tools that will help you get into that point consciousness state from which it's easier to go to body. So there's lots of tools that you can use. And this idea of using your sexual energy is just a tool. It's just a tool. And what I mean when I say that, I mean, it's not fundamental. It's not doing anything. It's not like it's 
opening you up to this in any way because you are um, not having sexual release. It just says that if you make that a tool and you believe that tool, and that tool becomes a metaphor that you use, then that tool will, will work that way. In other words, you'll get that experience. In other words, we, we heal. A lot of people do healing with a light, light beam. So they imagine that the, the stuff that is, that the illness is dark and black, and they take a light beam and, and, and kind of burn the black stuff away with their, with their laser or with their, their, their light. And that's just a tool. There is no light. There is no black stuff. These are just metaphors, you see. But it's a tool. And if that tool helps you focus your intent on what you're, on what you're doing, which is changing the probable future that that person will, will find health rather than, than illness, then it'll work. The tools, things that actually work. So yes, you can do those sorts of things. Use your sexual energy and, and uh, you know, uh, become a monk or whatever. But there's nothing fundamental about any of that that will actually help you go anywhere. I thought, you're, just, I thought you were going to say that it wouldn't be fun. I'm like, yeah, you're absolutely yeah, right. That probably it, wouldn't be yeah. fun. <laughs> it would, well, it's, it wouldn't be fun and it wouldn't be, uh, it's not even all that helpful. Actually, that puts you on a slower path, not a, not a quicker path. And the reason it does that is that, well, let's talk about being a monk. Now, let's say you do, you know, you're a monk and you're an aesthetic and you go find yourself a little cave and you just live there by yourself. And you spend, you know, 15 hours a day meditating and so on. And you do this. Well, you may develop your ability to meditate. And you may develop your consciousness in some ways. But there's other ways that you probably won't develop. Important ways you won't develop. So you take that monk and he's been in there for 10 years and okay, he can grab information, he can see things, he can maybe manifest things, he's, he's done all that. But you take him out on a, on a crowded street corner that you have to walk through every day, and he'd be freaked out, and he wouldn't know what to do, and somebody would bump into him, and somebody else would step on his foot, and a big dog would come up and lick him in the face, and he would totally be unable to deal with all of that, because he hasn't worked with that sort of thing. He hasn't dealt with that sort of thing. That's something totally new in his environment. And not that he couldn't work through it, but you have challenges in your environment that might seem like they're getting in the way of your spiritual growth or your ability to, to uh, say, do paranormal things or, or develop your intuitive side. But that's really you need to look at it, not that that's a problem that's inhibiting you. That's a challenge that will help you grow stronger. Hmm. For the most part, life is like that. You don't grow stronger because your life is easy. You don't go stronger because your daddy has a lot of money. You know, you don't go stronger because you get all the answers before the tests and say, you, you, you know, you get the cheat sheet and therefore you get great grades. That doesn't, actually do anything to help you. It may look like you're doing great. Okay, you graduated with a 4.0, but you didn't learn anything. You know, that uh, what you when you learn is by overcoming these things. Those these things are not things that get in your way. I think you'll be a much wiser person and you'll be a much I don't know, what's, what, what can I say? You'll, you'll be much better at your ability to get around in the non-physical if you have to overcome these things rather mm -hmm. than if you don't. So yes, go get in an ashram someplace or sit in a cave or whatever and meditate for 10 hours a day, but that won't actually help much because if you go into an ashram and get to know all those monks, you know what you'll find out is that most of them aren't very grown up. <laughs> there's a few of them that are very grown up, but there's a lot more that aren't a whole lot different than you are. Sure. Are there like master beings walking amongst us now, right? Like you're hearing these stories, like Yogananda's book, right? That is uh, becoming uh, 
more popular by the day, right? Uh, and speaks to these masters. Are there are they walking amongst us now? Well, there are people, you know, you call them masters. A master is just somebody that's gotten rid of their fear. That's what makes a master. Just somebody that's gotten rid of their fear. Okay, once you get rid of your fear, all of the uh, things that seem, you know, magical, you know, the powers and all of that sort of thing, all of that's just, it's very easy. It comes very naturally once you get rid of your fear. Once you become love, once you grow up, then the rest of that stuff kind of is falls into place. But you find out you don't really need to use that. Everything's just the way it's supposed to be. So yes, there are people among us who have grown up a lot, who have very low entropy consciousnesses, who are, uh, have a lot of wisdom. And yes, if they wanted to remote view what you did in your house at night, they could. But you know, they really don't want to. <laughs> That's not something they want to do. So they don't do a lot of those things. And they may look just like everybody else. And they may act like everybody else, but they just have a higher quality of consciousness. So becoming a monk and uh, using your sexual energy to somehow push the whatever up, those are just metaphors. They're not really real things. You can do just as well without being a monk and by having all the sex that's available to you and having a good time. Those things don't inhibit you. Only if you believe they do, does that, again, the mind leads, body follows. So if you have a belief that it's a problem, now you're putting negative energy into those things. Ah, these things are bad things. If I do that, that's getting in my way. Well, if that's a belief, now you're feeding, you're feeding the negative possibilities with that attitude. Hmm. If you have a positive attitude, say, oh, these things aren't going to bother me. I can, I can learn. Okay, I've got some young children and they holler and scream and, you know, they, they you know, keep me up at night, but then it's hard to, it's hard to meditate, you know, in that environment. By the time I get to bed, I'm so tired. I can't do anything because, you know, the, I work all day and I play with the kids at night and that's okay. Give to the kids, love the wife, enjoy the children, do your work. And by letting go of your fear, it won't matter that you have those things. You'll be able to go into a really good altered state that uh, takes you out to wherever it is you want to explore and you can do it in intensive seconds. You don't have to have an hour to meditate or even 10 minutes. You can just go there. But it's it comes from getting rid of your fear, not so much for practicing going out of body. You can practice going out of body and get to where you're reasonably good at it, but it won't make any difference and you won't learn anything from it if you haven't gotten rid of your fear. It's just- Have you oh, gotten rid of your fear? Like to this point where you're at in this experience now, this life packet, have you gotten rid of your fear? Most of it, yes. Not all of it, there's a, there's a few things that, uh, um, a few things I have to work on, but for the most part, yes. And that's why things are easy. You know, as I say, that's why I live in a bigger, in a bigger picture, but that's the key is the getting rid of the fear. And yes, you can go out of body. You can practice it and practice it to the point where you eventually can tame your, your, uh, intellect and get, you know, develop your intuitive side and gather data and go out of body, but you fly around and do things. And then 10 years later, you look at all the things you've done and it sums up to a little bit of nothing. You know, it's just, okay, they were just experiences, but you didn't really learn a lot. It was um, a lot of experiences that, that basically mirrored your own fears and your own attitudes and your own beliefs. And that's what you end up getting into. That's what you create. That's the sort of thing that that you do. So when you're first doing it, okay, you're you're a young guy and you start this and you get out of body, and the first five or ten years, you're doing a lot of fighting. You're doing a lot of, uh, you know, you, you meet a lot of negative things that you have to you have to get rid of, and it's, it's, there's a lot of that sort of thing. Well, that's because you have a lot of fear. 
That's, that's your fear that you're fighting. That, it, that's the fear that creates these negative situations that you end up having to fight in your being. That's why you get that. Eventually you outgrow the fighting and now you're not doing the, you know, the, uh, all the martial arts stuff in your, in your out of body experiences and fighting demons. You're now doing other things that are, uh, not violent at all and are more helpful and you learn a lot more. So a lot of what you get in the outer body depends on why you're there, who you are, how much fear you have. In this reality, our intent modifies the future probability in the out of body reality, your intent manifests reality. Now, your reality, I guess I got to back up to something that I think is maybe making it hard for you to understand. Your reality is information. You get information and you interpret that information to be your reality. And how you interpret it depends on what's inside of you. Your experience, your fear, your beliefs, that, that colors how you interpret the information. So you get information and you color it. You have, a, you have an idea, you have a, um, a fear, you manifest it when you're in these intuitive spaces. I'll just call them intuitive spaces. That's when you're out of body or, or uh, lucid dreaming or whatever. These are intuitive spaces. When you get there, you know, if you want, I don't know, you go out of body a lot or not, but the next time if you go out of body, you can just manifest your favorite kind of ice cream. And you can manifest a great big cone right there in front of you. You can pick that cone up and lick it. And I'll guarantee you it'll be the best ice cream you have ever tasted. It will be just fantastic. You can create it. Okay, You can create it uh, fear if you're frightened and think, gee, this is a scary place. I don't know. I'm in another reality now. Something there might get me. Well, pop. There you got a monster. Something there. Now you have to fight it. Ah. You see, you, it's your mind and the fears and things. You, you manifest stuff very easily there. So yes, you don't have to grow up much to do it, but you'll spend all your time chasing your fears around and uh, experiencing things that are so colored by your fears and your, your lack of experience that it doesn't amount to much. And as far as you're growing up and becoming love and getting rid of fear, it doesn't really help much. Oh, you make, you know, you'll have a lot of stories to tell, but it isn't, you know, it isn't really that important or significant in the big picture. So, you know, You're such I, a wise man, like, like the knowledge that you part on me is just, it's, oh, I'm always taken back by it, right? Like, um, you seem to know quite a bit of information like i go through your youtube your videos your playlists and i mean you speak about everything on the spectrum have, have you learned most of this stuff in these intuitive spaces where you've been able to i guess experience all of these lessons and and, and is that where you're drawing from yes for the most part that's true you learn most most of what you learn you learn in intuitive spaces whether you know it or not, you know, most of the things, most of your aha moments, most of the things when suddenly the puzzle pieces come together, all of that happens on the intuitive side. It's sometimes it happens on the intellectual side, but usually not. You know, you have, like I said, you have an intuitive side and an intellectual side. And the intellectual side is your, your tool there is logic on that side. Okay, your ability to think and be logical about things, be rational about things, understand processes and, and, uh, you know, consequences. That's, that's your, your intellectual side. Well, that logic is a very, very precise tool, but we almost never have enough information to really use it very well. To be logical requires a lot of information. You know, and most of the things that are important in our life, important. Uh, for instance, uh, you know, should I marry Sally or should I marry Sue? Well, my intellect isn't going to tell me anything about that. You see, and all of those important things, should we have, 
another child or should we stop where we are? Yeah, well, your intellect isn't going to tell you anything about that because it doesn't have enough information. So almost everything in your life that's important and the things that are most significant, your intellect really isn't much help. It's a lot of help finding where you left your glasses and your car keys. It's a lot of help uh, at work where what you do is use your intellect to, you know, sort things out and, you know, do jobs and solve problems and so on. It's, it's helpful there. But the big things in your life that are really important to you as far as your life goes, your intellect is a very weak player. And almost all the learning that would, that would turn into wisdom eventually is going to flow through your intuitive side, which is why everybody ought to spend some time developing that intuitive side. Because in our culture, we develop our intellectual side tremendously. You know, we hone it and hone it and read books and stuff more facts and information in it. And we've got all these intellectual understandings of things. And our intuitive side is probably not as good as it was when we were three years old. You know, we were probably more intuitive as a three-year-old than, uh, than we are now. Sure. Actually, three-year-olds, four-year-olds are very intuitive. They know a whole lot more than they can ever express. So we look at them and think that they really don't know much because they can't express what they know in language because they don't have the language skills yet. But they know a lot. A lot of the things, like a lot of things in relationship, in relationship between, you know, you and your wife, you know, and, and relationships with other people who come and go. Kids understand that in, in deep ways that's way beyond their ability to express. So we just figure that they never notice. They, they do notice. They have, they have good intuitive skills. But by the time they're seven years old, you know, most of that intuitive stuff's been pushed out of them and they've been told it's nonsense and, uh, you know, to uh, let that go. So they, they do. So that's a problem. We're very out of balance. We've got this, this very well developed intellect and, and a, an intuitive side that's, that's not even as good as a baby's. <laughs> so that's the problem and we need to, we need to develop it. It's, uh, that's important. Because once you develop it, you find out that you live most of your life through the intuitive side. Mm. That intuitive side becomes the 80% of your interaction in life, and the intellect becomes the 20%. It's, uh, and they work together. They're not, uh, they don't struggle with each other. Now, for most people, their intellect side is, is so much more developed than their intuitive side that the intellectual side kind of bullies the intuitive side, gets in front, always is butting in front of the, you know, the intuitive side tries to do something and the intellect butts in and, and trashes the experience. Because as soon as that intellect butts in, then you're gone, you're not out of body anymore. You know, your, your healing goes away, your ability to remote view, you know, evaporates because your intellect comes in and messes up with it. So that's because the intellect is very dominant. But when the intellect, isn't dominant, it's just a player, then the two of them work great together. The intuitive side has access to lots and lots of information that the intellect does not have. So it's much better at helping you make those big decisions, those choices of seeing things that eventually uh, draw patterns and understand how things work. Most of that's all on the intuitive side and the intellectual side is mostly there for the judging, judging what's uh, helpful and what's not helpful, whether where you're going is good or not good, uh, and for the, uh, the ability to analyze and assess and compare. How am I doing? You know, your intellect's good for all of that, and it's necessary. You have to have an intellectual side. It's not the intellectual side is trash. It isn't. It's very important. But it's not where you live most of your life. Most of your life as you grow up shifts over to your intuitive side because it's a richer, more, uh, more, uh, I don't know, more important, more significant uh, information mm -hmm. is, on, is on that side. And running around fighting monsters in the outer body doesn't really help you grow it up that much. You know, it's, uh, it's, not, uh, it's not that important. Now, the, the, the paranormal things can be very useful for people. And I don't 
say not doing paranormal things is, is better because when you do paranormal things and get fairly good at them, what it does is it teaches you that you are there's there's more to reality than what you thought than just this physical stuff. And it shows you another side of existence, you might say the soft side rather than the hard side, that it, that becomes more and more important. And you learn some humility that you're just something small and something a whole lot bigger. You kind of get that idea. And all, all in all, it helps you grow up and get rid of your fears. So I encourage people to pursue paranormal things, not because the paranormal stuff is, has any merit really by itself. It mostly doesn't. I mean, sometimes it does. It's nice if you can heal somebody who, you know, really needs the help. Your experiences in intuitive states with the big cheese, right? Like, how did you know it was the big cheese, right? And just this is 100% uh, your experience, right? So it's going to have your perspective. It's going to have your um, your twist on it. But like, how did you know it was the big <laughs> cheese? And what was that like? I can tell you some things about the big cheese that you might find interesting. First of all, kind of what is the big cheese and why does it exist and what's this job reality is a virtual reality virtual realities are made by rules if you have rules and a lot of entities <coughs> interacting with within those rules then you also <coughs> have to have some way to enforce the rules some way to assess the rules you know, is it a good rule is it working is it helpful? Is it just in the way, you know, so when you have rules, so you have to have some management that looks at the rules and, uh, and enforces them and assesses them. So <clears throat> the big cheese is a position that is an entity, just like you and I, it's an entity, individuated unit of consciousness. So he's kind of the manager over what in my book I call end division which is just a metaphor for a chunk of reality. It has several virtual realities in it, and our, what we call the physical universe is one of them. Okay, so he's kind of a, a manager just to see how everything's going. So the system doesn't have to do everything all the time. It has entities to help it do things. You know, it's hard to run a company all by yourself. <coughs> so... When I, I knew the big cheese before he was a big cheese, he was uh, one of my associates, uh, friends, teachers, mentors, uh, when I was very young. If you read the first section of my, of my book one, you'll see a little bit of my history and some of the entities that came and worked with me when I was young, big cheese was one of those. Well, he wasn't the big cheese then, that entity you know, uh, turned into, you know, got the job of the big cheese. So I have been interacting with that entity since I was six, seven years old. And I have interacted with it more or less continuously through that time, still interact with it now. So the big cheese and I, and, and from my point of view, we're old friends, you know, we've, we've done a lot of things, uh, uh, he has been a, a mentor of mine. And about, I don't know, I don't I have to go think about it a bit, but it was like 25, 30 years ago or something, the, uh, the, the, the big cheese that was before him really was starting to fail at his job. And he had uh, been compromised by some negative things. He just wasn't paying attention. Rules were being broken and, you know, nothing was being done about it. It was that sort of thing. So he just was not doing his job very well. And that became obvious as the, you know, the, the, the section that he managed started to go critical and he was replaced. And this friend of mine got the job. And he had been in and out 
of this virtual reality many times. So he was a, he was very familiar with this particular VR. And so since I knew him personally beforehand, otherwise, like the, the previous big cheese, I had, had kind of bumped into that function. That was about the only way I could say it. I bumped into that function some, but I didn't really have any connection, any personal connection to it. And most people wouldn't have after that entity gets in that particular position, it's not one where you sit down and, you know, have coffee with it and, you know, talk about, hey, what you doing, bud, you know, that sort of thing. Whereas when it's just an entity that's a friend of yours for, you know, 40 or 50 years, you do tend to have a more casual relationship. So that's, so I do have a good relationship with the, uh, with the big cheese, even and with the larger consciousness system. And that's just been generated over over years. My relationship with the larger conscious system has come about because I take pains to always react and interact, could I say, uh, correctly, the right way, uh, without causing any problems when I visit other reality frames. You know, if you visit another reality frame, you can do that by being like a, a voyeur. You're just looking in and seeing it. You know, you can see what's going on and you can talk, you can communicate, but you're not actually in that reality. You're just observing it. And there are entities do that here. They come and, and can observe this reality and you can kind of notice them and uh, connect with them. And a lot of people do. You can communicate, but they don't actually they're not here with a with a body like us but you can go into another reality frame and take on a body there so you are one of them but to do that the system has to put you into the data stream you have to be part of the data stream that that feeds part of you know the rendering engine has to include you in the data stream and that only happens if the system wants it to happen. You know, it's not something you can make happen. It's something you get permission to do, and it does it because you've you've asked, or it wants you to. So you have rules, and one of the rules is you don't cause trouble. You don't make a scene. You don't do things that interrupt the flow of whatever's going on in that reality system, right? So you you don't make a big splash. You don't break a lot of rules. You keep a low profile. You look around, you kind of learn what you need to learn and, and so on, and you can experience it, but you have to be, you know, I don't know, cautious about not blowing your cover. I guess that's maybe Have one you come to... close to that? Have you come close to screwing something up in a different reality? No, I haven't. Uh, I haven't done that. I've, I've always been very careful which is why the system will let me do that because I've always been very careful. Uh, I have created some, some issues that, that, uh, you know, I'm not always perfect. I don't always make the right choice, but, um, I have created some issues that were, uh Oh, but they didn't turn out to be big enough deal to actually cause a problem, you know? So it was a potential problem. I've caused a few potential problems that never turned into problems. And, that's where you screw up, but it doesn't really hurt anything. You know how that is in life. You know, you just, you screw something up, but it doesn't matter because it doesn't. No harm, no foul. Yeah. Right. So I've done a couple of, of those things, but so I have a good working relationship with the LCS because uh, for that kind of reason, and I have a, a good uh, relationship with the big, with the big cheese. Now I called it the big cheese just to make it less serious. That's why I named it the big cheese. I don't want people, you know, praying to the, you know, the, the big cheese, like he's, you know, the God, well, he's a manager, but I don't, I didn't want it to, to be taken that way. So I used big cheese to kind of keep it on the light, the, the light side. So people don't take the concept too seriously. Does he because hear all is. of that though? Does he hear all the praying to, to a God entity? Like, does he, 
does he realize that what his job is what he's here to do right and sees that and tries to influence it into maybe putting people here like no have a, no 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 he doesn't do any of that um that's not that's not his job he's his job isn't to be our god his job is to make sure that the machine runs you know that the machine keeps running uh well and uh doesn't uh, mess up not, so hands off so. right he delegates yeah pretty much hand hands off right now it's the lcs itself that does that function you're talking about it's the lcs itself that will create maybe a synchronicity that gives you some understanding that you wouldn't have had otherwise or that uh tells you uh, you get this thing in your mind that says oh don't go home the usual way go home go home the long way and you do it and then you find out there was this huge jam you know with a big wreck you know the way you normally went that's the LCS that that is works with people individually. That's not really a job of the big G's. The big G's is just more of a to see that uh, that the system is that part of the subsystem that has this reality in it and a few other realities in it that it's doing all right. It doesn't have it doesn't need the the LCS's attention. Hmm. You know, the LCS is like you know, we're like it. It's like us. We're a, we're a tiny version of it. It's a much larger version of us. So it can put its attention anywhere so it can see anything, anybody, anywhere, anything. But it has to focus its attention just like we do. And if it focuses its attention on everything, well, then it may, it may have its attention spread really, really thin but it misses a lot of stuff because it's not really focused anywhere. You see, so it's like you can watch, you go into one of those sports bars and there's uh, five different TVs, all five different games, right? Well, you can kind of keep up with all five games if you're interested in all five, but you miss things. There'll be something and, and you'll hear all the cheering over on that screen and you'll look over and you'll see, oh, you know, they made a touchdown and I, I didn't see it because I was looking at this other one. But you can kind of keep track of all of it, know what the scores are and how it's going. Uh, so it's like that with the with the LCS. If it's if it looks at everything all the time, it misses stuff. It's it's only you know partially aware of everything. If it really is looking at something because it has to take an action or something, then it's not so much looking at other things. So it, it's not the perfect sees sees everything all the time perfectly kind of a thing it's got to it's got to focus its attention where attention is needed and these the, the offices like the big g's cut off a whole big chunk of things that it doesn't have to worry too much about you know the, there's a problem in there that needs to be dealt with then the big g's can push that problem up and say you know we got an issue over here and that would work. So he's more to keep the system working than he is to, you know, to uh, keep individuals, uh, do things with individuals. But he is aware of the general way our virtual reality is working, how well we are evolving, not evolving, things that might help us evolve better. So it's not entirely it's pretty much hands off, but it's not mind off. He's keeps up with fundamentally what's going on and how it's going on in the big picture, not so much the details. So the big cheese is just an entity that kind of oversees a subset of reality. So what's the big out, cheese what's is, out there is watching the virtual reality, right? And, and you mm -hmm. said the, the one previously to that, basically wasn't watching it or not doing his job there were some things not, that screwed, yeah yeah wasn't up. doing his job so is there like um a, a kind of a, a a good force bad force thing going on where there's there's some manipulation there to to go in either direction yeah. right a pull there absolutely there is you know it's not by accident that the main theme of what almost everything in our culture is is good versus bad you know good versus evil is kind of you know that's what books are about that's what movies are about you know that's what almost all of our all of our creativity and literature and so on you know the good versus evil just is a consistent theme that's been around 
since people wrote things down and, and that we know about, and it's still dominant. It's the dominant uh, thing in our, in our lives. And it is in the non-physical as well. Because we have free will, we are free to make poor choices and to de-evolve if we choose to. Because you can't say, well, you have free will, but you only have free will to do it my way. You know, that's not free will. So we have, we have those who have evolved to the chaotic side, might be one way to say it. And they raise entropy rather than lower entropy. And what happens is they start to evolve that way and usually starts out almost accidental. They get to where they would have to turn around and go back. They've been digging a deep hole for themselves and turning around and going back seems to be like it's too hard. So they just keep going in the direction they're going and they get their, their, uh, what their positives, their things that, that makes them feel good out of, out of chaos, out of creating trouble. So do, do they have a big cheese too? No, they're pretty much disorganized. They are just part of the, part of the, uh, in, you know, the IUOCs, individual units of consciousness within the system. There's just some percentage of those that are negative. And the negative ones, like negativity everywhere, uh, you know, can cause a lot of trouble. You know, it, it's, it's, uh, you know, growing up positive takes effort. In any situation that you have, to, when you make a choice, let's say you get to some crossroads in your life and you have a choice to make, there's usually one or two good choices that you could make. You know, you could do it this way or you could do it that way. And the two good choices are probably kind of similar, but just a little different. But there's probably hundreds of bad choices that you could make. You see, so it's always like that. The low entropy choice is the picking the one out of the hundreds or even out of the thousands. Anything you do, no matter what it is, even if it's just hammer and nail, there's, there's one or two ways to do a good job at hammering a nail, but there's a hundred different ways to do it badly. <laughs> you know, you could, you know, hammer the nail with a piece of cheese, you know, that wouldn't work. You could hammer the nail, you know, with the wrong end of the hammer, that wouldn't work. You know, there's lots of ways to do it wrong, but there's only a couple of ways to do it right. So that's in general, the way it is. That's part of why it is so easy to do it wrong and so difficult to do it right. You know, it's hard to grow up. It's hard to make those right choices when there's thousands of poor choices that are, that are available as well. So what that does is it gives the, the negative side some leverage and the, the positive side kind of has to climb uphill. Its struggle is an uphill struggle all the way, whereas the negative side, not so much. You know, it's almost a downhill glide rather than an uphill struggle. For instance, you know, take the, you know, like the World Trade Center, right? How many men over how long and how much time did it take to build it? You know, well, probably a thousand people over what, five years or something, you know, it took to build that. How long did it take to destroy it? 15 minutes, you know? So the positive side is, a, is trying to roll, roll your rock up a hill. It takes effort, you have to focus on it. You have to want to do it. The negative side, all you gotta do is break things, you know, get in the way, trash stuff. It's, uh, it's pretty simple and easy. So some entities end up going that route and after a while, they figure that it's too hard to go the other way because they'd have a long, a long road just to get back to where they were, you know, before they started de-evolving. And they can learn to, you know, through practice, they can get good at being disruptive. So in what, some ways they can lower their entropy in a negative, you know, in a negative direction to where they can get better and better at being disruptive. So there's, there is the good versus evil going on as a, as a theme generally in 
consciousness <clears throat> just because we have free will. That's what allows it. So the, the uh, previous uh, big G's was not paying attention and things here in this virtual reality were starting to tip toward the negative. And it looked like you get, you know, when you have a big complex system, usually there's a, a tipping point. You know, it's like if you're, the more positive you are, the easier it is to be more positive. The more negative you are, the easier it is to be more negative. And you can get to a point, depending on what your population is like, that you get to a tipping point to where it's just a whole lot easier to be more negative than it is to be more positive. And in that case, <clears throat> you think of it like you have this big hill and you're up at the top of the hill. And if you're kind of balanced on that hill and you can fall down this side, which is the negative side, and then you'd have to climb back up. Or if you fall the other way, well, that's the positive side. So you have to be careful what you do. In other words, things get kind of critical to where the whole experiment here with humans evolving the quality of their consciousness and on this planet was in peril of sliding of slipping off that razor edge and starting to slide down that negative slope now it doesn't mean that that's a disaster forever but it may be a pretty big disaster for a long time we will come back because evolution will eventually turn around and chug itself back up that hill but it could have been a big disaster that cost us you know a century or something of our of our going forward and who was the big cheese during the ancient civilizations like back in the day where you hear you read about uh you know the atlanteans and all of that right like was there a big cheese back then too no actually i don't think there was a big cheese back then you know and this is something you'll probably find interesting it'll be a different subject but uh <clears throat> you know we have we have to grow up by our interactions right by our choices well, the larger conscious system had to do the same thing. It didn't just suddenly appear grown up, you know, without fear. It had the same sort of thing to do that we're doing. And we are teaching each other. You know, we, we challenge each other, you know, like we were saying in the beginning, to, to grow is a challenge. You know, putting yourself in a monastery makes the challenge just easier. But easier doesn't mean you'll learn more. Easier means you'll maybe make fewer mistakes, but it doesn't mean you'll learn much because you don't learn a lot from easy. You learn a lot from hard, but hard is harder. So it may take you time to learn a lot from that hard because it is, it is harder. So you may seem to be going slower, but you have more potential to learn. If you don't live in a monastery, you have more potential to learn. If you don't use so many tools, just deal with things straight up rather than uh, creating a whole lot of tools for you to interact with you know the world with with those tools rather than interact with them yourself so in any case the larger consciousness system when it started making individuated units of consciousness uh, and it expected those individuated units of consciousness then to interact with each other and with it to make more possibilities for it to grow into what well, it did, but the big cheese wasn't very grown up yet because it had been a monolithic thing. It hadn't had anything else with free will to have to deal with. So in the beginning, it had all these individuated units of consciousness that it had spawned and it was, it had to learn how to deal with them. And its first intuition was just like us, control, power, and force. She said, all right, all you IUCs, you know, line up, you know, here's what we're going to do today. You know, we're all going to be nice to each other, you know, so turn around and kiss the person next to you, you know, or whatever, you know, it was, it had, you know, I'm just making this up to be silly, but the idea is there. So it tried to, to bully, tried to push, push, demand, you know, control, power, force, just like us. And that's what you read about in the really ancient text that we have that's what you read about let's say in the the uh, you know you have the uh, what the old testament and the new testament right in the old testament 
You have uh, an angry, jealous God who turns people into pillars of salt when they don't do what they're told. And, you know, you have that kind of a, of a God that has a, that has, that is fearsome, but it's fearsome because it has fear. It has ego. It's a bully. It wants things, you know, it knows, it knows what's supposed to be done. And damn it, you IUOCs aren't doing it right. You know, you're not supposed to be doing that. You're supposed to be doing this. I'm the boss. You need to pay attention to me. You know, so it had all those issues. And what it learned, fortunately, it, it's, a, it's a bigger version of us, so it learns quicker than we do. But fortunately, it, it, it did learn that when you push and demand and force, you make everything worse. You don't help people grow that way. You inhibit their growing that way. And eventually, it realized that the optimal way to deal with people, to help them grow, is to get out of their way and just let them be and give them a, a safe space to be in so that they can make better choices. But you can't force it. You can't make them. You can't bully them. The change has to come from inside of them. So at that point, then individual free will became kind of sacred and, and uh, you know, it was all about love. So then we shift into the New Testament, right? God is love, not God is an angry, jealous God that'll strike you down if you don't do what he says. So that's, that is really a, the, a story about the larger conscious system growing up. It had to do that as well. Now the story about Atlantis is a is a uh, comes out of our very very deep memory, and at least this is my best take on it from what I've found out in my own travels, is that once this reality, once this virtual reality got uh, uh, evolved to the point that there were that there were uh, avatars that had choices that were interesting enough for uh, for IUOCs, individual units of consciousness, to play those avatars. Um, you know, when it, when it first started, the larger conscious system all played all the parts. In other words, all the all the entities in the in the simulation were NPCs. They're all being played by the system, just to let them develop and to evolve to the point that you had an entity that was worthwhile. Well, when they did, finally get worthwhile, then the larger conscious system said, all right, uh, you IUOCs, I want you to log on and I'm going to turn the, the choice making for these things over to you. I'm not going to run them all. And then the, I, the IUOCs were encouraged to log on and find an avatar and make all its choices for it and thereby evolve their quality of their consciousness because these were more, me more meaningful, more significant choices. So when it did that, some of the IUOCs were like, eh, I don't think I want to play that game. I'm happy right here in the chat room. And the larger conscious system said, it's really going to be good for you. You're really going to, you know, it couldn't force them because it had learned forcing didn't work, but it really strongly encouraged them to do that, that it was a, uh, so when does strongly encouraged become forced? You know, well, you know how that is with your children, right? You strongly encourage your children to do something. You don't necessarily grab them and force them, but you can uh, be pretty persuasive when you need to be. So that, uh, that happened. And in the memory of, of then, uh, of the people who were here, they had a memory of this on their intuitive side. They had this memory and they were in a place that was wonderful. It was great. It was, you know, it was a terrific place. There wasn't all this death and, and terrible choices and struggle and power games, you know, all that just didn't exist. They came from a place where it was peaceful and, and much better and much nicer than it is here. Here in the, in the uh, you know, the game that we play in this physical reality here on earth, it was a tough game. You know, it was uh, just like consciousness always does, you know, starts, it has to start at the beginning and it was power, power games and struggles and violence and all of that stuff. 
So that memory of this place that we came from, where we used to be and where we used to live, was this peaceful, wonderful place, and now we're here. We're stuck in this awful place. That is the, that is the idea. That was the feeling. And that eventually became in, uh, I don't know what, uh, what do you call that? Uh, mythology. That, that kind of, that mythological, wonderful place we came from, uh, that got in some circles turned into Atlantis. And it wasn't here. It obviously wasn't up on the land in here, so it got turned into, well, what happened to it? Where is it? Because people didn't realize, well, it's not in this reality frame. You know? And that wasn't, a, that wasn't a satisfactory answer. So they had to give it an answer that, that sounded believable, which is it has to be here someplace. Well, it's nowhere you can get to it. So it's either floating in the sky above where you can see, or it's under the water. You know, those are the only two places that can be here that you can't see. So you can see mostly the sky when you look up under the water. Nobody can see very, that's a murky, you know, distant place. So it got put under the water because that was a good place for it to be. But actually it was just part of our, of our memory of where we came from. And the thing that's interesting is you find that all over. You not only find that among these people who called it Atlantis, but you'll find it among the Hopi Indians in North America, who said they came from the stars. And it was a wonderful place. And then we got here and it was hard, it was terrible. And we had to, we had to uh, struggle here. And you find it in the Australian Aborigines, <laughs> you know, you find that same story basically everywhere. And if you read uh, Carl Jung, you'll see that's like a, an archetype. That, that story, you know, it's like a human archetype and humanity just has that in their, not their DNA, but, you know, in their consciousness at a, at a deep level. It's part of that intuitive space that there was this place that we used to live in that was a lot nicer <laughs> than the place we have now. So that's really where the Atlantis, Atlantis story comes from. And then, of course, lots of writers and people have picked it up and made more things to do about it and, and so on. Uh, Mm. Uh, that's, I love all of that. Yeah. Have you seen your next? I don't want to say reincarnation, but have you seen where you're headed to next? No, I don't really look at things like that. You know, people would have the idea. Well, okay, if you're if you're really good at all these paranormal things, you know, why would you ever? Why would you ever get sick? Why would you ever have a problem? Why would you ever cough? You know, why would you? Uh, why wouldn't your life just be? perfect. And uh, you would know everything before it happened, you'd be ready for things, you'd never get a surprise. And that's true. You could do that, you could live in that kind of a bubble. But who wants to live in a bubble like that? You see, if you if you do that, if you use those paranormal things to always look at the future probabilities and see what's coming and where it's going, and so on, you start to eliminate those things that happen from which you grow. See, the way you grow, the way you grow up is stuff happens, you have to deal with it. That's, you know, that's the way the schoolhouse works. Stuff happens and you have to deal with it. Well, if you live in that bubble, the stuff that happens is uh, always the stuff you want to happen because you've created it that way. And suddenly your life is easy and you don't have many challenges and everything is kind of expected and boring and drab and who wants to live in that kind of a place you wouldn't learn much so people people that i know who have gotten very good at the paranormal things after they've gotten good they kind of quit using it and they stop because they start living in a bubble of their own mm -hmm. creation and eventually they realize that that's a trap that's not what you want to do. You want to do just like everybody else. Stuff happens and you get to deal with it because that's more fun and a lot more interesting and a lot more learning is involved in having to deal with things as they happen. Mm -hmm. And some things are hard things. Some things are not so hard. Some things are fun and wonderful and some are terrible, but you have to deal with those because 
dealing with those terrible things helps you grow up if you deal with them positively. Always being in a nice, pleasant space doesn't help you grow up, prevents you from growing up. You don't have challenges there. So no, I don't look in the ahead and see what's coming. I don't, uh, I don't use the paranormal things to make my life come out the way I think it should. I just let my life turn out however it does. And that's fine with me because that's a whole lot more interesting and fun place to be than where you're in control of sure. everything. So you just don't, you just don't use it. And, and if you don't use it, yeah, you can still do those things, but you're, you're not as slick as you were when you were real practice with it, you know, just like anything else, you know, you always know how to ride a bike, but you're not as good on the bike after you've been off of it for a decade, you get on it, so you're, you know, you wouldn't win any races. You know, if you haven't practiced, uh, you know, recently, you're not, you're okay with it, but you're, you're not that sure. you're not, as, you're not as good as you were. So I'm like that, you know, I, all the paranormal stuff is, a, is, is available to me. And I use it off and on as I need to, you know, as there's, as there's a reason for it. Do you tell anybody that you're using it? No, I don't. I try to be completely inconspicuous and be just like everybody else. That's one of the things that I bring, one of the jobs that I had. I had, a, I had several missions, several things that I was supposed to do in this lifetime. And one of them was to be an example of that you don't have to change your life to grow up and become spiritual, to, to, uh, to grow up, get rid of your fear, to uh, be able to do all that paranormal stuff, to find peace and happiness and all of that. You don't have, there's not like, here's the prescription for doing that. You can do that in any profession, any situation, you know, you don't have to. So one of my things to do here is to be an example that you can just be a regular person and still be grown up. You can do it in spite of four children, in spite of, you know, pressure, you know, job with a lot of pressure in it, in spite of all those things, those things don't get in the way, really. You can let them get in the way, but they don't, they're not really, a, a, you know, fundamentally a problem. And trying to escape them by coming up with, uh, uh, you know, s slick ways around them, you know, join a monastery, live in a cave, uh, you know, try to trap your, your physical energy and let it, let it boost up your, your intuitive energy. Yeah, it doesn't work that way. It's just a metaphor that only works if you believe it. It doesn't uh, work. It sounds to me, that particular one about the sexuality, I think that was come that tool was probably created by somebody who was trying to create uh, uh, trying to create a uh, a justification for having a lot of sex but not having a lot of orgasms to go with it. You know, there's, a, there's a tantric process there. Yeah, there's something so, there. So have have sex for four or five hours, but uh, you know, don't ejaculate, don't, uh, don't, don't you know, keep all that energy in, like you've got some kind of storage battery and you're feeding it, you know, well, it doesn't work like that. There is no storage battery. <laughs> you can't, you can't feed it. You're not storing energy. All of that is just a, 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 a mind game or a tool to help people focus. Now, anything, anything can be a tool. If you believe that it works, you know, it's a tool. And this is where the idea is that, you know, magic happens because you believe it. Well, just believing something doesn't make it happen. But if you do believe something, you start putting positive energy toward that happening, you make it more likely to happen. And if you have the things that keeps things from happening, are your doubts, are your fears, I don't think that'll rule. I don't think I can do that. That's the stuff that keeps you from getting there. All right, well, if you have a a tool, you know, like Dumbo, you remember Dumbo was given a magic feather by his little friend. And he held that little magic uh, feather and he could fly. He, he lost his magic feather and oh, he was going to crash to the ground. Well, that was the feather was just a tool to focus his own tent on to get rid of that. Oh, I can't do that. Because if you feel like you can't do it, then you probably can't do it. 
that's the way it is. So yes, if you've got this mindset that, uh, oh, you know, I can take my sexual energy and I can put it up into my crown chakra and blast off my intuitive energy and that'll be a great thing. And if you believe that, well, then it'll help you grow up some because you have that as a belief. But fundamentally, nah, it doesn't work that way. You don't store energy and that doesn't make, you can't become love because you're storing energy. You know, you become love because you change who you are. You change, you change how you see life. And growing up and becoming uh, adept at, at, uh, in the non-physical, becoming uh, uh, at ease with all the paranormal things, that doesn't come out of, out of powerful energy. It comes out of getting rid of your fear mm -hmm. for the most part. It's, it's growing up as an individual. Do you think you'll and get I, to the point where you'll you'll take over the the big cheese's job? <laughs> Somebody else brought that up. I have no idea. You know, I don't. I don't even think about things like that. I just I don't worry about the future. The future will just come however it does, and I never I never think about it. It's well. Uh, well let me ask you this, right? Speaking of the paranormal stuff, right? I think I was reading a book, and I don't know if you're you were in this book, right? Names were left out, so identities. The title of the book is UFO of God, and I think you know who I'm talking about. Um, they see orbs. They went to the Monroe Institute, and um, he's uh, he's been to the Mon Monroe Institute. And I don't know if it was you were with you were one of the scientists or physicists that were there, um, but he talks about this, and he has an Instagram account, and he. He videos orbs in the sky at night, right? And every year at Easter, you know, he talks about his experience with the white lady who comes, who gives him messages that helps him along his path in his evolution, right? Mm -hmm. um, have you, what's your take on that? What's your thoughts on that? If you know who I'm talking about, you might not even know who yeah. I'm talking about. No, I don't know who you're talking about in particular, but I can talk about those kinds of things easily enough. We get information and we have to interpret that information. And typically we interpret it in terms of metaphors, you know, because that's, that's the most efficient way to, uh, to get the information. So you can, you know, you can uh, have a white lady that you're friends with, that's a non-physical friend of yours and they can give you information and all of that is, it, but, it's not so much that there's really a white lady. That's your metaphor for that information and how you get it. And the way that works is our, the way our minds work and the way our consciousness works is that when we get information from some, something, right? We make a metaphor that tends to make that seem reasonable to us. We create some thing. And what we do is try to go in and find a pattern that's in our experience base somewhere to, to make sense out of it. So what happens is if we get a communication, well, what kind of pattern are we going to make? We're going to get something that's kind of like us because that's what talks to us. We don't talk a lot to dogs or trees. We have conversations with people. That's our, that's our metaphor. So you're going to see something that's kind of humanoid. You know, and you can give it a sex, it can be male or female, it can be blonde or <laughs> brunette, whatever, you know, whatever just kind of feels right. It's the metaphor, the metaphor from your experience base that explains the feeling you get with this information and how you connect to it. So if the information is, is always nice and light and upbeat, and positive, then it's more likely it will be female person. If it's tough and this is the way it is, you know, shape up, suck it up, cupcake, you know, life is hard. If it's that kind of, it's probably male, you know, so we give it attributes. That means that we can take this information and turn it into something that we can explain, that we can tell somebody else. You see, so otherwise we just get this information and we'd accept it. We'd learn from it perhaps, but we wouldn't be able to tell anybody else about it. All we'd say is, well, I get this information. That's not very satisfying. That's very abstract. 
we want to, we tend to want to make things concrete. It's easier for us to deal with concrete things in our mind than it is for us to stay with abstract things. So what happens is we turn that then into a lady that's in white or a, a guy with a robe or, you know, whatever, an old man with a long white beard, you know, we turn it into something that is a good metaphor for us for the kind of information and the kind of connection we feel. Because we feel a connection and we feel it in terms of like a feeling of lightness or goodness or, you know, we kind of feel it in energetic terms, if you want to put it that way. That's kind of the feel we get from it. But then we turn it into something that we could tell somebody else about. It. In other words, we turn it in, into things that are physical like, physical metaphors. A woman, you know, who talks, who speaks to me because she has a mouth, you know, and she has eyes and we can see each other and, you know, she's whatever, you know, so it's a metaphor. And that's where those things come from. The real, what's fundamental is you're having, you're getting a data stream, consciousness to consciousness connection, data stream. Most of the time that data comes from the larger consciousness system. If you grow up to a point where you're, where you're pretty grown up, then the system sends you data streams a lot of times that'll help you grow. And you could make, you could, you know, you could, <laughs> you could say, oh, I ran into this amazing three headed chicken. And it told me, you know, that I should, you know, but of course, that's not a good, that's not a good metaphor, three headed chicken, you know, we don't talk to three headed chickens, and that's silly, and you wouldn't be able to tell anybody else that. So you don't come up with a three headed chicken, you come up with a, a beautiful lady with long, you know, blonde hair and wispy white gown and whatever, and she's beautiful, and she's love, and you just feel completely at ease when she's around, and she's just awesome. And, you know, you, you pack all of this feelings and attributes that you get, you pack those into a package that looks like a woman, because now you can think about it. Oh, what did what did she say? You know, you can think about it. You can bring it back up in your mind, and you can have a conversation about it, and you write about it in a book. So we do that. That's just our nature. But the only thing that's really going on is you receive a data stream. And your reality is your interpretation of that data. When you're out of body, you're receiving the data stream. And what you experience out of body, that's your interpretation of that data stream. Okay, so the system will send data streams to you. <laughs> Look at that, we've got a pretty little girl showing there. Hi, sweetheart. The white lady. <laughs> yeah, that's the white lady. <laughs> so the system, if you're, if you're less grown up, then the system will send you things that you can relate to. And maybe you pull out your, your chop chop sticks and you go, you know, fight the evil and that's what you're doing. Okay, well, this, you know, the system can play that game with you because that's the level that you're at. You've got a lot of fear and you see a lot of evil and you want to fight evil and rather than fight your own fear and get rid of your fear, you don't see it that way. You see it's the evil that's out there that's the problem, not the fear and the neg negativity is inside. So you project what's inside outside and there it is and you get to go fight evil in the service of good. Okay, because that's the kind of, that's the place where you are now. So you grow up a little more and maybe you get white ladies in, in beautiful white gowns, you know, who tell you lovely things. And that uh, would be a, a better metaphor for somebody who's maybe more, a little more grown up, who, who learns things. You know, so people will have non-physical friends. They will have uh, people they talk to guides, all sorts of things that they interact with, that give them information, that tell them things that help them out in their life. And all of that is the larger consciousness and giving them, working with them in a level to which they can understand and at a level to which they're likely to learn from it, to grow up from it. So well, let me ask you this. How do you validate some of that information, right? Like I've had a lot of uh, channels on the show, right? But how do you validate that information? The only way to... Well, you can, let me put it, 
you can't really validate it in a in a in the perfect sense. What you can do, and what I tell everybody who practices wants to do paranormal things, is that the first thing you have to do is do things that you can validate, that you can check, like remote viewing. So you remote view a particular picture. Somebody gives you a number, and that number is associated with a picture. So you look at the number and describe the picture. All right, now you, after you've penciled the picture down, you, you know, you've drawn as best you can, you've written all what colors are in it, you've described as best you can, then you go look at the picture and find out did you get it right or did you not get it right. That's validation. And you have to do those kinds of things enough until you, in, until you become confident that what you're getting is real data. So you have to do things. If, if you're healing people, you have to not just heal somebody and say, oh, yeah, I worked on their head and their headache went right away. Well, it maybe just went away because some other reason. You know, it, headaches go away sometimes just spontaneously. You have to do it enough with enough cases, not just a headache, but here's somebody who's been chronically ill and unable to stand up for 10 years. And you work on them and the next day they stand up. Well, now that's a lot more than a, you know, the headache went away. That's something that was, you know, very unlikely that that would have happened just after you worked on them. So you have to do it enough that you can build up confidence over time that what you're doing is really has an effect. The data you're getting is actually real. And eventually you will develop a sense of when it's real and when it's not. Even when you're remote viewing, you know, people eventually they'll say, I get this and they'll say, oh, that's garbage. Start over. You know, they'll get a sense. And when they get it, they know they've gotten it. And when they put that down, they know they're, they're right. You know, and this, this is the right thing. And very, very seldom are you disappointed with that. When you know it's right, it's almost always right. So given enough time and practice, you get a sense of when it's right and when it's not. And you, you get a sense of the kind of skills and the set of tools you use, and you get comfortable with those. And that's then when you're doing things that can't be validated. Let's say you talk to a dead person and a dead person says something. There's no way to validate that. You know, it's not like you're going to call the dead person up on the phone and ask them if they really said that. So the way you validate that is first you have to do all these other things. You have to grow your ability and over decades, really, you learn to know when you're getting it right and to be good enough that you get it right almost all the time. You know, very seldom do you not get it right. So that's, that's kind of how, but in anything that somebody says, oh, there's, you know, I got this or this or this other thing, you don't know. They don't really know either. Data comes to you through three sources only three sources. One of them is the larger conscious system sends you data. Some other individual unit of consciousness can send you data because all consciousness is netted and you can create data yourself and send it to yourself. You're a creator of, of information. So consciousness can create information. Other consciousness, your consciousness, or the larger consciousness system. So anything you get is one of those three or a mixture of those three. But those three don't come with different colors or, or with flags that tell you which one it is. You just get it. So that's why I tell people always be skeptical. Be skeptical of everything you get. If you go out there and you get something, one, realize that it's probably a metaphor. Don't necessarily take it liter literally, okay? It's not necessarily, the literal thing isn't necessarily the truth. The truth is it's metaphor for the information that you're getting, for the feeling around the information. The second thing is that you have to take yourself very skeptically because your own, if you have fears and you have ego and you have beliefs, then the stuff you get is going to mirror that stuff. So if you want to not have that color, then you have to get rid of the fear. And you get rid of the fear, you get rid of the ego, you get rid of the beliefs, and now you are likely the things you get are real. You're not coloring them with that junk anymore. So there are ways to get to the point that you're fairly confident that what you get is good. 
but particularly if you're a beginner and haven't been doing this for decades, eh, you're still in the process of figuring that out. You're still in the process of developing those, those skills. And sometimes the skills are just very precise, like they can only get this kind of information about that kind of thing. And they're almost always right with that. But if you ask them anything else, oh, they don't know how. They can't do that. That's because they have learned, they've built confidence that they can do this, and they haven't built confidence that they could do the other thing. It's mainly a matter of, of that confidence. But the confidence has to build by starting with things that you can check, things that do have a physical parallel, and you can look at it and say, did I get it right or did I get it wrong? And after you've done that for a decade or so, and you, you get sensitive and you, you know about what feels right and wrong, then you can kind of branch out and other things. But still, if I get something, I'm skeptical of it because I don't know. I know I got that, but I don't know why I got that. Because sometimes the larger consciousness system will purposely give you misinformation if that's going to help you grow up. It'll sometimes give you something just to help you learn something. Like, if, let's say, uh, um, here's one that, that happens a lot. Uh, let's say you're, you are a person that uh, can't really make any of your own choices. You have to get a higher power to make all your choices. So you've got this nifty little pendulum and, and uh, you can ask any question, yes or no, whether, you know, should I go to the grocery store today? And if it swings this way, it's a yes. And if it swings the other way, it's a no. Or you've got some other way of telling an oracle. Or you go talk to your, your spirit guide and ask them and they tell you. Well, when you get to where you're no longer exercising your own free will because you don't have confidence in yourself and you don't think you're much, you don't, you know, I'm a little bit of nothing, but oh my God, now there, he knows everything. So why should I make these things? Why don't I ask him about things? Well, that's not good. It's not good for your growth. It's not good for your growing up. You're, you're relinquishing your responsibility, you know, to, to uh, exercise your free will and grow from it. So what will happen then is that this, this data that you get will tell you to go take a long walk off a short pier. You know, it'll, it'll run you smack into a tree. It will cause you some kind of difficulty. It'll make you put your money in a bad deal. It will give you wrong information just to tell you, start making your own choices. If you believe everything I tell you, eventually I'm going to tell you to walk into a tree because you need to stop doing that. So the system, if it's good for you, good for your growth, good for your development, can give you misinformation. And there's another thing uh, the, that happens a lot. Remote viewer I knew who was very good at it. And he's got his ego kind of puffed up about how good he was at it. And he was helping law enforcement. He was doing all kinds of things, getting very public with it. You know, I'm a great remote viewer and I'm always right. I got it, you know, and he was good and he did get a lot of things. And pretty soon he's seen, you know, buildings on the dark side of the moon, uh, you know, full of aliens that are, you know, whatever. And of course, his credibility goes away and everybody says, well, you know, he doesn't know what he's talking about. And then, of course, a, a satellite goes around the moon and photographs the dark side of the moon in very, you know, fine detail. And, you know, none of that stuff's there. It's the front back side of the moon looks just like the front side of the moon. You know, it's just all pocked up, full of craters and, and so on. So he got all that misinformation just because he was just too, you know, too full of himself with what he was doing. It was feeding his ego. Mm -hmm. It was helping him de-evolve, not evolve. So the system will sometimes give you a misinformation or give you a little uh, slap to, to get you straightened out. So when I get something, the other day somebody said, Tom, do you think that the universe is really 13 and a half billion years old? And as soon as they said that, the number 15 jumped right up in front of my face. And uh, I would have assumed that that was the answers 
15, not 13 and a half, but 15. And, uh, but I'm very skeptical. So I don't say anything because that could be wrong. System may just be seen if I'll take that bait and run with it, you know? Oh yeah, gee, I know all these things. It's really 15. Yeah, well, that's just ego talking, you know? So it's just an opportunity for me to screw up and therefore to learn something. Is that it? Or did I really get the right answer and it's 15? Well, I don't know because you never know why you get something or what the source is, you know, that, uh, so who knows? So yeah. I don't take, I don't always take the things that come to me seriously at all because the system can give me information just to tempt me to puff up a little ego. Hmm. You know? So Tom, this has been it, awesome, man. I, I just loved our time together. Right. And I love your work. I love having these conversations. I love being a, a brother in this exploration of consciousness with you. I learn something new every time I talk to you. Uh, you never cease to amaze me. I can't thank you enough for taking the time today. I mean, we, we've gone two hard hours and it's been, it, it seems like five minutes. Yeah. It goes by fast when you're having fun, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, Trey, I'm, uh, we've done this before, and we'll no doubt we'll do it again. Uh, I hope your listeners, uh, you know, will enjoy it and learn something from it because that's the that's the point to help people understand a little bit more, so it makes it easier for them to grow themselves up. Mm -hmm.